The year is 1887. Emil Berliner has just been granted a patent for his latest invention. He discovered a way to record and playback sound onto a flat disc, calling his invention the gramophone. But Berliner's invention wasn't the first technology to record and playback sound. A decade earlier, Edison debuted his phonograph. It worked by etching onto the tin surface of a cylinder as it rotated. The quality of the first phonograph recording was not good, but it was the first time sound had ever been recorded and played back. So audiences were understandably amazed when Edison debuted his recording of Mary Had a Little Lamb. Mary had a little lamb, it sprinkled with white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Edison's cylinders and Berliner's discs competed as the two popular technologies for recording sound in what could be considered the first music format war. Around 1910, discs finally pulled ahead thanks to a couple advantages. Their flat shape allowed them to be stacked and more easily stored. Additionally, sound could be recorded to both sides of a disc, doubling the storage capacity, something that's impossible to do on a cylinder. As discs became the popular sound recording format and their production continued, the industry settled on a standard rotation speed of 78 revolutions per minute. This meant that the typical 10-inch record could hold three minutes of sound per side. Audiences no longer had to go to a symphony hall to hear their favorite songs. Instead, they could bring the music they loved into their home on a record. But music also had to fit into this new format. Gone were the days of symphonies with their multiple movements and seemingly unlimited time span. Music now had to fit onto one side of a record to be played uninterrupted, no longer than three minutes. This led to the single, which is still the popular song format today, although the three minute time restriction is long gone. These early records were made out of shellac, offering good sound quality and durability, at the cost of being stiff and brittle. The process of recording these early records was pretty simple. Put on a blank wax record, press play, and have musicians perform into a single horn. As they played, the sound would be etched into the record in a process pretty much the opposite of playing a record that's already been recorded. Once the recording was finished, the newly cut wax record was used to make a master that could then make a number of duplicates. Even today, the final recording of a piece of music used to make copies is called a master, and there's even an entire process of getting these final copies ready called mastering. The completely mechanical process of cutting directly into a record is called acoustic recording and comes with a number of limitations. First, there was only one take. Any mistake would be cut directly into the record forever. This caused a lot of fright in musicians at the time. Up to this point, music had only been performed live, so any mistake could just be fixed next time you play. The limitations of acoustic recording also had an impact on the music. Acoustic recording could only handle around three and a half octaves. If a song sounded like this live, Then recorded acoustically, it would sound like this. Loud brass instruments like trumpets overpowered pretty much everything else and fit right into the limited frequency range. In an effort to get violins heard on these records, they were replaced with stro violins, violins with horns added to them. Some low instruments like the upright bass were removed entirely, replaced with tubas in the hopes of getting the bass line heard at all. The frequency range of acoustic recording didn't favor all instruments, and it didn't favor all singers either. Those with voices that sounded better in this limited frequency range became more popular, and this is how Enrico Caruso became one of the most popular singers of the early 1900s. Musicians and consumers had to deal with the limitations of acoustic recording until 1925, when the invention of the microphone revolutionized the recording process. Recording with microphones only allowed one take, everything was still cut directly into the record, but musicians no longer had to play into a central horn. Electronic microphones also captured more frequencies, expanding the range of a record to five and a half octaves. Listen to the difference these added frequencies make. Still not a perfect recreation, but a vast improvement over acoustic recording. The next big change for records wasn't until the 1940s and the start of World War II. Shellac, the popular material for making records, was needed for the war effort, 
so manufacturers had to find a new material to make the records. During the 1930s, some companies had made records out of vinyl, but the high price point and release during the Great Depression prevented the material from catching on. But record companies never forgot about the improvements vinyl offered, increased storage capacity, and less background noise. The two main record companies of the time, Columbia Records and RCA Victor, began developing a new record format, one that would use vinyl. In 1948, Columbia Records released their long play vinyl record, or LP. With a speed of 33 and a third revolutions per minute and a 12 inch diameter, it could hold 45 minutes of sound between the two sides. This was an incredible improvement over shellac records. Gone were the days of the three minute single. Now music could be listened to as part of a larger body of work, launching the album era of music. Artists could make songs of pretty much any length they wanted, and even dictate the listening order. Almost immediately, artists embraced the long play of vinyl record, and albums like The Beatles' Rubber Soul and The Beach Boys' Pet Sounds began exploring the possibilities of this new album era. A year later, in 1949, RCA Victor released their new vinyl record format, the Extended Play, or EP. This was a 45 revolution per minute disc, 7 inches in diameter, offering 15 minutes of sound between the two sides. While not as long as Columbia Records LP, it became the default medium for the single, still a popular music format despite the invention of the album. These 45 records are identifiable by their smaller diameter and much larger center hole, around 5 times bigger than the hole in shellac and LP records. This larger center hole allowed the records to withstand a faster acceleration, part of RCA Victor's new technology to more quickly switch between records. It also locked consumers into the RCA format, unable to play records with smaller center holes on an RCA machine, a common practice in any format war. Columbia Records LP and Victor RCA's EP became the two popular vinyl record formats. Even today, if you were to go into a record store and buy an album, it would be on the long play or LP vinyl record format. As the years passed and production of these records continued, various improvements were made to the sound quality. The frequency range was eventually brought up to match the human spectrum. And in 1957, the first stereo record was issued. This meant that the left and right channels were completely different, an innovation that gives sound a much more surrounding feeling. Recording two separate channels onto a single record groove was possible by putting each at a 45 degree angle. If a sound was only recorded to the left channel, when the record was played, it would push the needle up and to the right, leaving the opposite channel up and to the left completely unaffected. This allowed the left and right channels to be completely separate, creating true stereo sound. As vinyl records continued to improve, new technologies began emerging that would challenge vinyl's monopoly on recording sound. In the 1950s, the first real competitor to vinyl appeared, magnetic tape. It wasn't until the late 60s that tape found its way to consumers in the form of the cassette. Offering portability at the cost of sound quality, cassettes became the dominant format for listening to music in cars. Vinyl was still preferred for at-home music listening. As the sound quality of cassettes improved, they began to offer a real challenge to vinyl records, eventually outselling vinyl by 1983. And then came the CD. Completely noiseless, no sound degradation from needles, just perfect audio replication. It was only a matter of time until the price of CDs dropped low enough to compete with vinyl. And by 1988, CD sales had passed vinyl sales. The reign of the vinyl record was over. They had been rendered obsolete, never to be used again. Or so it seemed. Nowadays, vinyl is back on the rise. Sales have been steadily increasing ever since bottoming out in 2006. They'll never retake their spot as the dominant music format. Streaming just offers too many advantages. But their physicality and nostalgia gives them a special place among music enthusiasts, ensuring that vinyl records will continue to spin for a long time to come. Thanks for listening. Let me know what you think of vinyl and how it compares to other ways of listening to music. You can find Sound Selection on YouTube, as a podcast on iTunes, or on Instagram.